Hello and welcome to another episode of The Mark Moss Show, where we talk about the decentralized revolution. We're talking about the way the world is changing, looking through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. Of course, we're talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and how they are driving this change as we look across through these three lenses. Now, uh, each week I'm trying to bring you some new education so you can look at these things differently so you can understand them in better context of what's going on in the world today of course i try to bring you the latest breaking news so you know what's going on and when i can some interesting guests you can hear some different perspectives other than just myself and there's so much to learn and one of the things that i try to talk about on a regular basis is trying to help you understand what's going on and we understand things by taking complex subjects and we make them easy to understand by taking them down to what we call first principles level they're most basic and once we understand them on the first principles level then we're able to understand them at a more complex level but we're also able to start to formulate our own ideas off of them if you don't take the time to understand things down to the base layer First, first principles, then you're never really going to understand them. You'll never be able to think about them on your own. You'll never be able to formulate your ideas. All you'll be doing is just parroting headlines that you see over and over and over. Now, you don't want to do that, do you? Because then you'll find out just, you know, repeating a headline and you won't really know what you're saying. And then someone's going to uh, be smarter than you and they're going to make you feel dumb. And you don't want that to happen. And I certainly don't want that to happen to you. So we'll try to break these things down so you have that education here on the Mark Moss Show. Now, you know, I was recently, uh, last weekend, I was speaking at an event in Las Vegas called Freedom Fest. It was an awesome event. Now, I go to a lot of events. I've probably going to way too many events uh, recently. <laughs> I'm thinking about uh, scaling back on some of my speaking engagements. Uh, but I really like this one because it was something that I don't normally do. So I'm typically at financial conferences, which of course, that's my niche. So you'll see me at financial conferences, like a couple, couple uh, last month, I was in Miami at the Rebel Capitalist Live. Of course, my own events that I do, Market Disruptors Live. Uh, we have tickets going on sale for next year's event, marketdisruptorslive.com. You can check that out. Um, but also, you know, other financial events, Bitcoin events, the Bitcoin event in Miami. It's the largest Bitcoin gathering. There's about 40,000 people there. And of course, yours truly. I was a speaker on the main stage there talking about Bitcoin and macro. I was also, I worked the news desk for a couple hours. So anyway, I'm at those types of events, finance, Bitcoin, etc. But this Freedom Fest was something that I don't normally do. It was just about freedom. That's a big word. And as a matter of fact, today, it's sort of a dirty word. <laughs> uh, I, I can't believe that I'm alive to see that some people think that freedom is like some crazy fringe right wing or something like that. Um, freedom is uh, dangerous. It's violence. Uh, I would agree it actually is dangerous. Um, to let people be free, but that's part of being free. So anyway, Freedom Fest, and it was about all types of freedom. So there was, uh, you know, quite a few um, uh, libertarian groups that were there. As a matter of fact, I was invited by Joe Jorgensen. Shout out to Joe, uh, if you're listening, Joe. Um, she is the, I believe, the only female who's ran for president two times. And she's ran for president under the Libertarian Party. So Joe Jorgensen invited me there. And we did a panel on, um, titled... Uh, the price of money. It was an interesting panel. Um, it started out really well. It kind of started going into this kind of like a back and forth war against a bunch of different cryptocurrencies. Was uh, one I wasn't super interested in engaging in, but the initial uh, price of money I thought was pretty interesting. And so then I got to speak to lots of people there at the Freedom Fest. And like I said, there was people from the Liber uh, Libertarian Party. There was people there for monetary or money freedoms. Um, so there was gold guys and investment guys. Um, and then there was um, health freedom. So then there was some of the big names that you might know, like Del Bigtree or Dr. Robert Malone there on health freedom. So all different types of freedom. Uh, one thing that Be Del Bigtree said, if you guys don't know who Del Bigtree is, you should definitely check him out. Um, he has a lot of passion. I love a guy with a lot of passion. And he was, he was on a rant and he was on stage and he said, I don't care about your money. I think that was kind of a point to Bitcoin or, or gold. I don't care about your money. I don't care or freedom of money. I don't care about freedom of guns and your second amendment. He said, this is the battle of our lifetime. 
over your body. If you don't have freedom over your own body, you have no freedom at all, which was an awesome point that he made and one that I would agree with. So anyway, it was great to do that. But anyway, back to the point. So I was on this panel and I'm walking around the conference. I'm talking to all these different people who, who are all from different areas of life and they've come for all different reasons except for all about freedom. And I got asked a lot of questions and um, I found that there was just this massive um, misunderstanding, but also, yeah, misunderstanding, I guess, uh, lack of understanding, maybe even is a better term of what money even is. And I know that sounds kind of basic and don't turn me off yet. Don't turn me off yet. I, I'm going to, I'm going to back it up. Right. So what is money? Well, I know what money is. I can open up my wallet. I have some, or I can go on my bank account and I can see how much money I have, but what is it? How is it used? What does it mean? And uh, understand that is the key to understanding what the heck is going on today in the world with the Federal Reserve and printing more money and raising interest rates and the economy shrinking and all these things. So there's that whole thing going on. Um, so you need to understand what money is to understand that. Uh, but also um, how we could fix that, how we could have better versions of that and what we might have in the future. And if you don't understand those basic things, then you just really don't have that first principles understand to build that on. So I thought, you know what, I'll take some of these questions. And I spent hours and hours and hours talking to all these people there at the event. And let, me, let, me, let me talk about this to my audience here. Um, that's you. <laughs> that's you listening right now. And, I, and we'll try to break that down. So Understanding money is, is difficult. I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning, uh, or maybe I will real quickly. Let me, let me go back to the beginning real quickly, and then we're going to advance past that. Uh, so if, you're, if, you're, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, stick with me. I'm going to go through it real quickly. By the way, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show, talking about what I call the decentralized revolution, looking at through the lens of politics, finance, and technology, and as the world is changing right before our very eyes. And so what is money? Uh, money is a medium of exchange. Money is something that communicates value. Um, it communicates um, what people want and what they don't want through something called price signals. It coordinates economies. So we could say it's a communication. Uh, we can say that it's a store of value. I don't want to get super philosophical with you here. Uh, but basically, it's a way that I can store my value to be used at a later time. So I can store my wealth, my value, and I can use it to buy other things, medium exchange. We don't need money. We don't, we don't want money. Now, you might be going, what do you mean, Mark? Of course I want money. I want, I want as much money as I can. Well, you don't really want money. What you want is the things that money will buy you. That's what you want. You want the things that money will buy you. So money is just that medium, medium of exchange. It allows us to get what we want. It also, as I said, stores that value. So for example, let's just say that uh, I have to work for four hours a day to earn enough money to buy the food that I need to stay alive. Well, let's say that I decide to work an extra four hours. So now I'm going to work eight hours that day. So I work an extra four hours. What do I do? How do I store that energy, those four hours that I worked? Well, I could put it, I get, I get paid in money and I hold that money. Now that four hours, that, that extra that I worked, I'm storing it in money. And tomorrow I could decide not to work tomorrow because I have those four hours saved up and I can buy that food that I need for the next day. Does that make sense? So now that we have a very basic understanding of money, what it's used for, how it works. We also have to understand that money is emergent. So what do I mean by that? Well, again, we don't want money. What we want is the things that money will buy us. So in the beginning, we didn't have money. We just had barter. I would trade you a chicken. You trade me a goat, right? If we're on a deserted island, you'd have coconuts. I'd go get a fish. And we trade for the things that we really want. But what happened is barter is extremely inefficient and it doesn't scale because you might not want my coconuts, my fish, my chicken, or my goat. And if you don't want any of those things or the, the goat or the, the cow is too big, it's not divisible enough. You only want a little bit of the cow, but I only have a whole cow. And so, well, if you don't take my, if you won't take that, would you take this instead? And that thing becomes a medium of exchange. And eventually enough things become a medium of exchange that one emerges. We were talking about before the break, talking about what is money uh, and more specifically, so you can understand uh, what's going on today with inflation and the Fed and are they going to print more money and what's happening with Europe and the bonds and all of these things. And so you have to understand them at the most basic. As I was saying, I was uh, speaking at the Freedom Fest this last weekend and this one piece of information is seemed to be the biggest stumbling block for everybody. So I thought we'd talk about that today. So we talked about what is money. I'm not going to go back and rehash that. If you missed it, you can you can check it out on the podcast. Check out Mark Moss podcast. Just search that on the iHeartRadio app. Of course, you can check it out on iTunes anywhere that you listen to podcasts. 
Oh, and by the way, while you're at it, check me out on social media at one Mark Moss. That's right. At the number one Mark Moss. Now, um, so what is money? So, um, money is like this favor. It allows me to store my value so I can spend it at a later time. So we got past that. Um, what, what we use as money is emergent. We used to do barter because what we really want is the food or the, the goods or services and we'd barter, but then we didn't have, um, if, if I didn't want my chick, if, if I didn't want your chicken, or you don't want my goat, we didn't have a deal. So we used a medium of exchange, we trade this instead. And eventually enough things became used as a medium of exchange where one thing emerged as the best. And of course, that was gold, gold was money for 5000 years, you have to have the right attributes for it to be a good form of money. So for example, it needs to be portable, it needs to be durable, it needs to be divisible, it needs to be saleable, it needs to be fungible. I'm probably not going to spend a bunch of time breaking all of those things down, but durable makes sense, right? If you used bananas for money, well, within about five days, those bananas are rotten. So it wouldn't be a very good form of money. Any type of food wouldn't be a good form of money. It's, it's not durable. It also needs to be divisible. So if it was a cow, a cow wouldn't really work because you can't really break a cow down into small pieces. It also needs to be fungible, which means one is always worth one. So for example, you've seen like the oldest, dirtiest dollar bill you've ever seen that has tears in it um, is still worth the same as one brand new crisp dollar bill. So they're, they're fungible. And so of course, uh, animals aren't fungible, right? Uh, things like that aren't fungible. Baseball cards aren't fungible, um, which is, and then, and then finally, uh, we need to be saleable. So enough people have to be willing to take it. So it could have all those attributes, but if no one's willing to take it from you, then it's not a very good form of money. Um, and, and, uh, and that, that kind of sums it up. And that's why gold really fit that bill. The problem with gold is it's not real portable. Now I can put gold coins in my pocket and you and I can exchange, that's fine. But in the information age, gold doesn't work. I can't send you gold over Zoom. And so um, it didn't work. Now actually gold failed a long, lot longer before that. Uh, and it failed because it's not portable. And this is an important piece to understand. So. Um, gold, it, because it wasn't portable, I needed to pay somebody, I'm in New York, somebody's in Germany in the 1400s or the 1500s, what do we do? Well, we don't really have a deal. And what we could do is we could put a bunch of gold on ships and we could sell it across the Atlantic, but then the ships crash and they get taken over by pirates and all of that. So that's not very, that's not very, very good. So what did we do? How did we solve that? Um, now real quick, that would be what we would consider commodity money. So commodity money would typically be uh, that there's a there's an evolution. And this is a big piece that people miss. There's an evolution to this. And so a lot of people are very quick to dismiss new things today, uh, because they don't know, it, it, it's, it's not that today. So uh, Bitcoin isn't the best medium of exchange today. It's too volatile. Okay, well, maybe that's today. But does that mean it will always be that way? Um, if we saw a little oak tree in the forest, um, and I said, Hey, imagine this oak tree is going to be a hundred foot one day. And you're like, no way. Look how small it is. I'm like, but it has the attributes. It's, it's an oak tree, but no, it can never be that way. But you have to understand things can evolve. Um, and so th things would typically evolve starting with a collectible. Hey, this is pretty cool. It's collectible. Let's collect it, right? It's a cool, it's a shiny rock. It's a cool feather. Um, and then eventually things can become stores of value where if enough people collect them, then we store our wealth there. And you see that with uh, rich people today, they store their wealth in um, collectible cars or, or paintings or things like that. Um, and then um, eventually it could evolve into a medium of exchange, but only if it has those qualities that I've given you before. Now, a Mona Lisa painting is a collectible um, that has become a store of value. People are putting their value into those things, but it can't really become a medium of exchange because it doesn't have the money properties. It's not divisible. It's not portable, right? It makes sense. It's not fungible. <laughs> well, there's only one Mona Lisa painting. Um, so it's, it doesn't have the money in this quality. So it stops evolving there. And it's important to understand that and we've had commodity money in the past. So commodity would mean that it has to be something that's useful or needed. And so gold was used for electronics, right? There was a need, you're going to listen to pe people like Peter Schiff tell you that uh, gold has intrinsic value. There's intrinsic value there. Money must have intrinsic value. And I'm surprised that Peter Schiff says that because he's a very strong uh, Austrian economist. Um, and he should understand that uh, there is no such thing as intrinsic value, that all value is subjective, all value is subjective. If I had a billion dollars of gold, but I was on a deserted island and I had no boat, no phone, no food, no water, nowhere to spend the money, that gold is worthless. It's completely worthless to me. 
As a matter of fact, it could be a liability because now how do I even carry that around on a deserted island? So it's worth, it's worth nothing to me. There's no intrinsic value to it. Now you might say, well, food then. Food would have intrinsic value because if you had it on the deserted island, that food would be worth a lot. Yes. But last night at dinner, I threw my leftovers away. That food had no value to me. See what I'm saying? So it's all subjective. Now, um, you know, for those leftovers, if I was hungry, I mean, if I was really hungry, maybe it'd be worth money less than what it would cost me to go buy the full meal. So let's say I was a homeless, you know, homeless or whatever, and it's a $30 steak, maybe I'll pay five bucks for a piece of that steak. But if I was on that deserted island, and there was that piece of steak, I would give my entire life savings for that. So again, value is subjective. Hopefully that makes sense. And you have to understand that. Uh, and, and because of what we have today, so money started out as commodity money, gold, it had value. And then it had moneyness properties, durable, portable, divisible, etc. But then something changed. And this is the key piece to understand, because if you can understand this key piece, then you can understand the revolution that we have today. More importantly, you can understand what we're going to need to transform the world. This is a very key piece. And what is that? Well, that's the portability piece. So we live in the information age today. We don't live in the physical age in, anymore. And like I said, we use Zoom. I can't send you money over Zoom. So in order to get that gold or any, any commodity money for that matter, to become more portable, we had to do something to make it have more velocity. You've heard this term, velocity of money. So in order to get this velocity of this money, we had to do something. But that is the crux of the problem. That's where everything comes off the rails. So I'm going to explain that to you and more so you can understand what, what's wrong with our money and what we need to, to solve this thing. I'll explain that to you and more. You listen to the Mark Moss Show, by the way. We're talking about the decentralized revolution. We're talking about the way the world is changing through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. Of course, we're talking about Bitcoin. And we're talking about money today, what it is, so you can understand it, so you can formulate your own ideas off of it. So you're not walking around like a mindless parrot parodying everybody else's thoughts. Now, we're talking about uh, money, so you can understand the problems that we have today and formulate your own ideas off of that. We went through a bunch. I'm not going to recap it. If you've missed it, don't worry. I got your back because you can catch me on demand. Just search Mark Moss Podcast. Uh, find me on any of your favorite podcast players, iHeart app or uh, iTunes or whatever. So anyway, here we are. Um, I was I left you at the cliffhanger, if you're still with me. I left you at the cliffhanger, and the reason why commodity money failed, commodity money, gold, the reason why it failed is because it was not portable enough. And so in order to move the money faster, we had to do something. In order to get velocity, you always hear about velocity of money. They, the, the economists, the Federal Reserve, tell you that the, the velocity of money is too low. And so in order to get the money to move faster, in order to add velocity, they had to do something. And that something is they had to add debt on top of it. So gold is a base layer. It's settlement layer. If I have the gold, I have the gold. No one debates that I have the gold. They can see it in my hand. And if I hand you that gold, you have the gold. And we see it in your hand and nobody debates that. That's in the physical world. The problem is, as I said, it's very slow. So if I want to send it to you in New York or across the sea, it's very slow to get it there. So in order to get it to go faster, we had to add a second layer on top, and that second layer was debt, a liability. So what do I mean by that? Well, now what we do is we put the gold in the bank. So now I don't have the gold and you don't have the gold, but neither of us have the gold. What we do is we put the gold in the bank, and now the bank has the gold, and they owe me the gold. So instead of me having the gold and me owning the gold, and I have the gold and everybody knows I have the gold, now the bank owes it to me. It's kind of the same, but not really. Obviously, if I have the gold, everyone knows I have the gold. As long as I can secure the gold, it's my gold. But if the bank owes it to me, there's a chance I don't get that gold back. There's a chance. Now, each of these banks have their own different risk rewards. Now, if I want to send you the gold in New York, now it's very fast. So the bank just credits. They say uh, on their ledger, on their piece of paper and their computer thing, they say, uh, Mark no longer has the gold and now you have the gold. And that's it, it's a ledger statement, very quick. So in order to get that velocity, they had to add debt and they did that and that's how gold scaled. The problem with that is now we have to trust. Now we have to trust the bank 
to keep track of that gold. We have to trust that uh, if they say, I if I have the gold, that they say I have the gold, and they don't arbitrarily just say that you have the gold. We also have to trust that they haven't done something with the gold and maybe don't even have any gold at all. What if they say you have the gold or say I have the gold, but they don't actually have the gold? Mm, like fractional reserve banking, sort of. We'll come back to that. So um, that's exactly what happened. We had to introduce debt, and that um, then led to these paper gold certificates. So those were claims on the gold. So now anytime I want, I could take that paper claim. I could go to the bank. I could get that gold. It was an IOU. And that's how that worked. Now what happened is eventually people started trading those gold certificates around enough where they started to think they were money themselves. And eventually, in 1971, the government said, oh, no more gold, now you just have paper. And so that's where we get the term fiat money. And a lot of times people think fiat means uh, fake or something like that. No, the word fiat means by decree, meaning it has value because we say it has value. So again, remember money, gold emerged. Money is emergent. Gold emerged as the best form of money. And this is a key piece to understand. Gold has value because we say it has value. We assign value to it. There's nothing backing gold. Gold is just gold. There's nothing backing it. But the debt has to have something backing it. So when they gave me that paper gold certificate that I could go redeem for that gold at some point, what was backing that claim? What was backing that claim that I was holding? Well, it was backed by the gold that I could go redeem for that paper gold certificate. But what's backing the gold? Nothing. Nothing backs the gold. The gold is just the gold. The gold is the asset. It's a physical asset. It's a key piece to understand. The reason why it's a key piece to understand is because people would ask all the time, for example, like, well, what's backing Bitcoin? And again, that just shows that there's a, there's a complete lack of understanding of what money is. Only debt needs to be backed by something. For example, um, you might own a home or probably you own a car, right? You own a, you own a home or you own a car and you probably have a loan on one of those assets. And the bank, some bank is holding the note to your house or to your car. And they hold that on their books as an asset. What's backing that asset? Your house or your car, right? If you don't make your car payment, you don't make your house payment, what are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna take that piece of paper, they're gonna go claim and they're gonna take your ownership of your house or your car. That makes sense? So only debt needs to be backed by something. What backs a house? Nothing. It's just a house. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a house. What, ba what backs a banana? Nothing. It's just a banana. Now, if I issued you an IOU saying I owe you a banana in the future, you had a claim for it. What backs that claim? Well, the banana. See how that works? So when people say, well, what's backing Bitcoin? Nothing's backing Bitcoin just like nothing's backing gold. Now, some people would say, well, Mark, that's not true. Um, energy backs gold, right? Uh, they had to use uh, earth movers and dig up ground, and they had to pull the dirt, the, the dirt out of the ground and sift to get the gold out, and they had to refine the, the, the gold. And so there was great expense that was spent. Energy was spent. Money was spent. Time was spent. Uh, dollars were spent, you know, maybe it was thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars to produce that ounce of gold. So all of that time, money, energy backs the gold. Well, yes and no. Uh, but we'd also say the same about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has miners and there's electricity and there's man hours and all those things. And you have a cost to produce a Bitcoin as well. So it's, it's important for money to have a true cost, no doubt, which is why the fiat money system is so wrong, because I can just arbitrarily click a button, produce more money. So money does need to have a true cost, like gold, or like Bitcoin, but there's nothing backing it. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so anytime you hear someone saying that uh, what's backing gold, uh, Bitcoin, then you just know there's a complete lack of understanding of what money is, uh, just like there's nothing backing gold. Now, the reason why I bring that up is for a couple reasons. So first of all, asset backed cryptocurrencies. They make no sense. I want to talk about that. But I want to talk about something even bigger, which is the real revolution that changed the course of humanity that most people aren't realizing right now. And that's how we took physical property and made the leap into the digital space. I mean, this is mind blowing, <clears throat> but most people haven't really thought through it. So I want to talk about that. <clears throat> but we'll start with the, um, asset-backed cryptocurrency. So a lot of people, I get comments 
across my YouTube channel, which by the way, if you're not following me on YouTube, you should just search Mark Moss on YouTube. I put out a couple teaching videos a week on there. I typically, you know, 20 minute video taking a very complex subject, breaking it down with charts and graphs. It's all visual. Um, so follow me on, on, on there if you're not already, um, and on, on, on social media as well at one Mark Moss, but I get comments. I get 5,000 comments a week. And uh, I see these comments all the time. It's like, I would never trust something completely digital. It's not real. It's not tangible. I can't hold it in my hand. What I would rather trust is, what I'd rather do is if, if, if there was a gold-backed cryptocurrency, if it was backed by something. So could we have a gold-backed cryptocurrency? Um, there's recently one, um, a, a carbon credit, crypto carbon credits, where carbon credits are backed by the cryptocurrency. Um, but these things have deep issues with them. And so I want to break that down. The problem, the problem with trying to back something by adding the debt on top of it, and then we're going to talk about, like I said, this the real revolution of what's just happened that nobody's paying attention to. And if you're missing this, you're going to miss out on this whole thing. Uh, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. We're talking about the decentralized revolution, talking about the way the world is changing through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. I talk about all three of those things. Right now we're talking about mm, history and finance. But uh, I'm going to be back with more to explain to you this base layer, this first principles thinking, so you can formulate your own ideas off this. Because if you don't understand this, you're going to miss what's going on. You're going to miss the biggest opportunity of your entire lifetime. And I certainly don't want that to happen to you. Today we're talking about what is money from a first principles level. And the reason why that's important is, like I said, I was at this uh, event, the Freedom Fest. Shout out to Freedom Fest. I'd love to come back if you want to invite me back. Um, and I just talked to all these people that just didn't understand what this was. And so they have this, they, they, have, they have all these misunderstandings of, of, of the economy and how money works because they don't understand this. And I don't want that to happen to you. So uh, I'm not going to re rehash it all. If you missed it, check it out my podcast on the Mark Moss Show. Just search Mark Moss Podcast, iHeartRadio app, iTunes app, whatever. Um, so um, we've re we covered all that. So um, gold backed or asset backed cryptocurrencies make no sense. They make no sense. And the reason why they make no sense is for the exact reason that I've explained with gold. In order to get gold to have velocity, we had to add debt. The debt is what sped it up. But the problem is, is it leads to all sorts of what we call counterparty risks. Like I said, what if the, what if the person keeping the ledger just says, well, Mark doesn't have the gold anymore, now you do. I mean, I trusted them and now they just, they, they, they screwed me over. Or what if um, they actually get rid of the gold and they just pretend they go ledger, ledger, back and forth, but they don't really even have the gold. So we have to trust that they have that ledger. The problem is, is that over and over and over, they've broken that trust. So 1933, um, they created, they got rid of the gold. They had way too many of these IOUs. And so what did they do? Well, they stole everybody's gold. The government of the United States seized your gold, stole your gold and made it illegal for you to own gold. Why? Because they didn't have it. They needed more of it. Um, 1971, they did it again. So how can we trust that? We can't. Uh, we saw what happened with Russia. Russia got their bank account seized. We saw the Canadian truckers, they got their bank account seized. So that money in the bank is a liability. Someone owes you that money, but the person that owes it to you, the person that keeps that ledger could just wipe your ledger off whenever they want. That's the problem. So why would I want an asset-backed cryptocurrency? So why would someone say, well, I can't trust, uh, um, I can't trust Bitcoin because I can't hold it in my hand. Now, if it was, an, if it was a gold-backed cryptocurrency, I could trust that. But, but why? It's the same problem. So now what? I have a token that represents a claim on that gold that that person's holding for me, which is the exact story I gave you. But how do I know they really have that gold? How do I know when I give them that claim, they'll give me the gold back? I don't. And there is the crux of the matter. There doesn't need to be anything backing it. Like I said, we're starting to see all types of things being backed, crypto being backed by things. This latest one is this carbon credits are backed. Uh, crypto, crypto is backed by carbon credits. Again, same thing. Um, but it doesn't make sense to take a physical thing, a real world thing, and try to back it with something digital. But of course, that doesn't stop people from trying. Um, and we can see, of course, ex WeWork CEO Adam Newman. Now, if you're familiar with the story of WeWork, um, I hate to bore you. So actually, I won't. I'm not going to go deep into the details. But WeWork, you know, they had this great idea. They were going to go do long term leases in uh, Class A office buildings. And then they would break it up and sublease it out to individual people who wanted places to work. Um, 
it, the company ended up being worth more than all the buildings that they had rented out. Well, how does that make sense? It, and, and it doesn't. And if you understand how that doesn't make sense, then you understand who Adam Newman is. And uh, eh, I guess he's kind of a scammer, uh, of course. And that's why he's creating this new carbon credit backed thing, which doesn't make any sense. But let me, let me, now that you understand that why that doesn't make sense, let me explain to you what actually happened here. So we have physical things, as I talked about. If I have gold, I have gold. If you have gold, you have gold. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows it. It's what we call a bearer instrument, a bearer instrument. If I have it, I, if the bearer owns it. It's a bearer instrument. Stock certificates used to be bearer instruments. Um, but the problem is, is as I said, it, it's not portable. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't happen over space. So in order to go into the information age, we now have to use a ledger. Someone has to hold that physical asset, right? That's the problem. But what Bitcoin did is it solved that problem. And now it allows us to have a, a bare instrument, but digitally. It's never been done before because digital things can be copied. You send me a file, now I have the file and you have the file. I make a copy of the file. I can make 10,000 copies of the file. Digital things get copied. So for the first time in ever, we figured out a way to have a digital bare instrument. It's never been done before. And do you understand how big that is? Because this is the problem that, that we're stuck with, where all of these assets get um, centralized. And then I always say centralization leads to manipulation. Now they have those assets, they manipulate those assets. They say we have more than we did, we don't want to send them back to you, all these things that can happen. And so it solved that problem. Now we have digital bare assets. It's, it's the first time we've ever been able to have digital property that has no counterparty risk. So, uh, you know, you have an asset, uh, you own Tesla stock, at least you think you do. I mean, it's in my E-Trade account, but I guess E-Trade owes me Tesla stock. Do they have the Tesla stock? Well, no, it's actually owed to them, which is owed to them. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a liability. There's counterparty risk. There's a chance because I don't have it in my hand that I might not get it back. But Bitcoin solved that for the first time now, we have a digital asset that I can take custody of and I have it. And if I wanna send it to you digitally, I can do that with nobody in the middle, no counterparty risk, no liability risk. Now, why is that important? Well, as you might imagine, <laughs> we live in an information age today. The problem of using physical commodities that they don't scale. And so the only way for the world to work. The only way for the world to work using something like gold or something physical, oil, commodities, things like that, is to put debt on top of it. But that debt leads to then trust, us trusting the person with those assets. And we have to trust that they don't manipulate that. They don't create more of it. But we've proven, proven all throughout humanity that we can't trust those people. As a matter of fact, that trust has been brought to the forefront and slain on the altar with the trucker pro protests in Canada. And then for the whole world to see with Russia, one of three super superpowers with nuclear weapons that got their accounts seized. And so now for the first time in history, we have a asset that can scale with pure velocity without putting debt on top of it. We've never had an asset before that we could scale without putting debt and debt causes the problems. Do you see where we're going with this? So for the first time, one of the oldest problems in, 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 in mankind is how do I store my assets in a way that can't be stolen from me? Bitcoin solved that. How do we have an asset that we can apply velocity to without adding debt? Well, Bitcoin solved that as well. Now, um, it's about as deep as I'm gonna go, but hopefully you can understand that and you can start to see where these problems lie and how big of a solution that is. Now, what does that mean for the future? Um, there's been countless books, <laughs> I don't know, hundreds of thousands of hours of podcasts and shows talked about this at, at length. So uh, we can't get into all that, but I wanted to give you this base foundation of what money is, how it works. So now you can start to build your own ideas off this. So now when you hear um, the federal government wants to increase the debt ceiling, uh, you understand what they're talking about. When you understand that currencies around the world are starting to fall and uh, they need to have bonds, they need to take on more debt, you start to understand what that means. Now, all the reasons, all the perversions, all the distortions that all this debt creates, again, that's uh, tens of thousands of hours of discussion that we can get into that. Um, but don't worry, I will. <laughs> As long as you tune in with me each and every week, you're listening to The Mark Ma Show, talking about this world that's 
changing right before our very eyes, the decentralized revolution, talking about it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. Each and every week, I'm going to keep filling you in on bits and pieces of this. We like to say that uh, fix the money, we can fix the world. Pretty much every problem that we have in the world today, from lockdowns to censorship to Russia, Ukraine, to, um, to incarceration rates, to obesity, uh, you name it. They're all caused by distortions of the money supply. So if we fix the money, we fix the world. And we do that by getting rid of the debt. We need an asset that can scale without adding um, the uh, scale with velocity without adding the debt. And that's what Bitcoin solved. That's the real revolution that's happening that everybody's blinded to. But now you're not. Anyway, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Thanks so much for listening. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably gonna really like this video right here and this video right here.